This week on The Laura Flanders Show, two co-conspirators for 30 years talk about the movement for reproductive justice. Some victories and some battles ahead. Lynn Paltrow and Loretta Ross, this week on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the ones who are doing it. Welcome. often talk on this program about building being as important as resistance. This week we're going to talk about both, possibly in an unusual context, reproductive justice. In April 2017, a federal court in Wisconsin struck down a state law authorizing the detention, forced treatment, and incarceration of pregnant women as unconstitutional. Our guest, Lynn Paltrow, played a part in that, representing the plaintiff. But we're also going to talk about her vision of what you might call a reproductively just society. What might it look like and what model of organizing could get us there? Does the Wisconsin story offer any examples? Paltrow is the executive director and founder of National Advocates for Pregnant Women. No stranger to this program. Lynn, it is great to have you back. Thank you. It's good to be here. So a law was struck down. You're celebrating. Why? What was the significance of this particular case? This was a case about uh, the attempt to sneak into law basically what people understand now are called personhood measures. Uh, the attempt to use law to create separate rights for fertilized eggs, embryos, and fetuses, and at the same time subtract the people who get pregnant from the community of constitutional persons. Which means? Which means for Tammy Lacher, the plaintiff in this case, um, she was pregnant or she thought she might be pregnant. She couldn't afford health care. She had a terrible problem with her thyroid. She was dealing with the lack of energy and her depression by using a little bit of methamphetamine and marijuana just to deal with those issues. But when she thought she might be pregnant, she was like, I have to go to the doctor, I have to get my thyroid medicine, and I'm going to do everything I can to have a healthy baby. But Wisconsin, in the guise of helping and protecting so-called unborn life had passed the unborn child protection law that gave the state the authority to take any woman who habitually lacks self-control in the use of alcohol or a controlled substance to a severe degree so that cr creates a according to the law a substantial risk that that use is endangering the physical health of a child and what it really did is this it made Unborn children, defined as existing from the moment of fertilization, children under the juvenile court's jurisdiction, and also women or people who become pregnant from the moment they're carrying a fertilized egg. So you took two, the unborn child, as they call it, and expectant mothers, as they call them, and made them both children under the control of the state. And in doing so, took away from pregnant women any of the rights they might at least theoretically have under the criminal justice system and any of the rights they might have if somebody tried to civilly commit them. So what happened? What was the reproductive rights or reproductive justice movement doing at the time? Were they just not paying attention? Well, in large measure, laws that have not explicitly focused on denying people the right to choose abortion have really not gotten a lot of attention. If you can detain a woman because she creates some completely undefinable risk of harm to the fetus or the future child by smoking marijuana or by having alcohol before she ever became pregnant, because some of the women were taken into custody based on things they had done before they ever became pregnant. What do you think the state of Wisconsin will do if Roe is overturned? What's happening now around this? Because I could see in my mind's eye coalitions of kind of a new sort. Well, one of the things that becomes clear is, you know, you create this ideology of protection uh, that is really used to deny protection. So the crack baby myth was one that was completely sold on racism. Uh, the idea that these were particularly African-American women who didn't care about their babies and are doing this terrible drug that's doing terrible harm. And fortunately, the science just doesn't support that. It, uh, none of the criminalized drugs are 
uh, uniquely dangerous or uniquely even more dangerous than cigarettes. And I always like to say my mother smoked cigarettes through her whole pregnancy. Uh, I'm a nicotine baby, and maybe if she hadn't smoked cigarettes, <laughs> I would be a for-profit lawyer. I, I don't know. <laughs> However, uh, that mythology of harm and uh, the, the idea, and we see this in both the drug war area and in the uh, anti-abortion signs that said the most dangerous place for an African-American child was in its mother's womb, is this message over and over again that the greatest risk to our children is their own mothers, not the communities they live in that have been deprived of economic resources and safety and roads that work and clean water. Pregnant women in Flint, Michigan were told not to drink the water. The principle that Wisconsin put into place would hold them uh, criminally or legally liable if they dared to drink the water and couldn't afford bottled water instead of the poisoned water that the administrations there allowed to be uh, affected by lead. So in this case, the law was thrown out as unconstitutional. Huge victory. How's Tammy? What happened to her? Well, what happened to Tammy, the rest of the story, is she goes to the hospital and says, I realize I, I, I think I'm pregnant. Could you confirm that? I realize I really need to get this thyroid problem, which is a risk to pregnancy, under control and confides about her past use of drugs. That information is, her confidential information is turned over to state authorities, the Taylor County authorities, and while she's hospitalized, there's a court hearing that she's told about over the phone. Her uh, fetus gets a court-appointed lawyer, and she gets none, and when she says, I don't want to be uh, participate in this hearing without a lawyer, they proceed to have the hearing, and or force her, say, you must go into residential drug treatment, which is not what she needs, or you will go to jail. And when she doesn't cooperate with the forced treatment, the lawyer for the fetus, who is supposed to be acting in the fetus's best interest, proceeds with contempt uh, proceedings against Tammy Lacher, and she is thrown into a county jail where she asks for drug treatment. First of all, she doesn't get her thyroid medicine while she's there, and when she asks for prenatal care, they say, well, we can't give you prenatal care until you take a pregnancy test, at which point she says, I'm incarcerated because I am pregnant, and they put her in solitary confinement and threaten her with a taser. She spends 18 days incarcerated in county jails where Pregnant women are treated terribly where they don't have access to prenatal care. So whatever shared concern we have about yeah. protecting, improving, uh, ensuring the best possible outcomes for pregnant women, uh, for, uh, for babies, it is never going to come by giving police officers, prosecutors, and DAs the power to be in the prenatal care exam rules rooms and to decide what's best for that pregnant woman and her future child. And the outcome of that pregnancy? She was out of jail in 18 days. We, she found her way to National Advocates for Pregnant Women uh, and the other groups that are helping with her case. She has a, now a beautiful two-year-old boy. So that's the good news. And there is good news in this, because these moments that we're living in now are not the same as the ones that you described in the 90s. We have challenges for sure, but I'd love your sense of what progress perhaps we've made, if we've made any, and that question at the top, like what's your vision of a reproductively just society that could get beyond this absurd uh, equivocating about a, what, whether a woman actually has rights? Well, I mean, whether a woman is a, is a constitutional person. I think that we have made the mistake of assuming we won that battle because of the achievements, particularly for white women. Uh, they were so enormous from the 50s to today. But I think the Trump campaign and this presidency shows us that, that the value of women, that not only uh, is it uh, a legal fact that we're not fully protected by the U.S. Constitution, that it's not clear that the Equal Protection Clause includes women or gender, uh, but that there really is uh, a lack of valuing women in general. And then I think what happens is there's a confusion. We want pregnancy to be completely under our control. We want it to be always a choice. But for the species to survive, we have to reproduce. And so that every policy we make from the very beginning, whether it's about housing or economic justice or education, should include 
recognition that half of the people have the capacity to get pregnant and we should have a plan in place for them so that if you are a high school student who gets pregnant your choice isn't to be thrown out of school or be told if you miss too many classes for prenatal care you're going to lose your public school education it should be planned from the beginning that everything so that primary health care in America does not include either maternal health care or reproductive health care. And the fact that we have things that we call maternal health care and reproductive health care and they're not together mm -hmm. are all of the things that we have to change if we want to have reproductive justice. And our anxiety about anything connected with anything to do with drugs? Well, we have anxiety about that, and fortunately there has been a vibrant movement pushing back, but that movement too, the put in, for example, in Colorado, where there has been legalization of marijuana, the first pushback has been to define parents who have any amount of marijuana in their home or any pregnant woman who uses marijuana as if it's child abuse. Now that hasn't succeeded, but if we don't anticipate and include parenting and pregnant women in our policies from the beginning, that's where the, the backlash will come. And so it's to our advantage if we want to ensure that things like drug use, pregnancy, sex, sexuality are dealt with as health issues, not as criminal justice issues, not as child abuse issues. We should be planning that as part of our 50-year strategy. So I'm hoping that you and I will not still be having these conversations in 50 years. We have had them for what seems like 50 years. Is there anything cheering you up in this moment? Are you, how are you sort of measuring progress versus backsliding? In the work that we do, there were too many women who were being arrested in relationship to their pregnancies, even under the Obama administration, that the right had so pushed things so far. And what the Trump presidency has done, I think, has helped expose that at a time where a new generation of people see everything in terms of the reality of, of that it's about race, it's about gender discrimination, it's about discrimination around sexual orientation, and that the only way we are going to achieve anything like ending mass incarceration, ending the war on drugs, that is a war against families and individuals, is by working across issues together. Lynn Paltrow, thank you so much. It's great to talk with you. Thank you. We're going to talk next with Loretta Ross. Um, you've known her for a very long I time. I certainly have. Uh, do you want to introduce her for our audience? Uh, that is such a privilege. Uh, I met Loretta Ross a very, very long time ago when we were both younger in Washington, D.C. And she is the person who really imagined reproductive justice and understood that it is not enough uh, to fight for reproductive health, something you have to have enough privilege to go to a doctor and access health care. And it was not enough to have rights because if you can't afford a good lawyer, what difference does it make if you have rights? She imagined the whole picture, a human rights vision that includes absolutely everyone, including the people with the capacity for pregnancy, and the understanding that if you don't address race and class and gender as part of everything we do, we will never achieve the vision that we hope for. My interview with Loretta Ross, next. So Loretta, welcome. Nice introduction by Lynn, huh? Oh, I love Lynn Paltrow. She is the best ally I've ever had in this movement. Well, there is likely to be a whole new generation of allies that you have in this movement, apropos of the book that you and Ricky Sollinger have just produced. It is an extraordinarily valuable and, of course, brilliantly informed account of the birth, life, and continuing challenges of the reproductive justice movement. Um, so thank you for the book and for taking the thank time you. to write it. Start with why you decided a primer or primer on reproductive justice was in order. Well, the central thesis of reproductive justice is how every empire, every government, every state needs bodies. And reproductive justice explains whose bodies are valued, whose bodies are devalued reproductively. But when you talk about reproductive justice, you're talking about the right to have children and the right not to have children. And of course, the right to raise our children in safe and healthy environments. And that brings us into conversation with Black Lives Matter, environmental justice, climate change. I mean, you say at the beginning of the book that there is an upsurge in reproductive justice activism. Where do you see it and what are you thinking of? Those movements you just mentioned? 
Well, surprising to me at least, as one of the 12 co-creators of the framework, when we did this in 1994, we had no idea we were launching a whole new movement. We were just protesting the omission of health, reproductive health care from health care reform. So we were working on policy, but what we did was seed an idea that we have the human right to control our reproductive options, and we have the human right to have assistance to enacting our reproductive choices. And so it's ended up displacing the pro-choice framework quite inadvertently, because we did not start out centering white women in our lens so that we could come up with a whole new framework. We centered black women. But in the years since then, we've seen major pro-choice organizations rebrand themselves, reproductive justice organizations. We've seen hundreds of women of color organizations come about, particularly Sister Song, my former organization, is celebrating its 20th anniversary this year. And many pre people predicted we wouldn't last five years, much less 20. So there's a lot going on on the ground, even if we're looking with sadness at what's happening at the national political yeah. scene. Well, before we look at the sadness, <laughs> let's look at what's happening at the ground and what that change in frame did. Because it isn't just about changing the name from choice to justice. It fun your adoption of the human rights framework with women of color at the center of marginalized people changed the whole context really for the conversation. I say that it deprivatized what in US law had been a very private sphere kind of discussion. Um, Roe versus Wade was a, based in our privacy right. Choice is a private right to a decision through Putting that human rights lens on it, you changed all that, how? Well, privacy was always a thin support for reproductive justice or any kind of justice because what the Supreme Court giveth, the Supreme Court can and will take it away. And so we felt that by pivoting away from the limits of the U.S. Constitution into the global human rights framework, not only did we provide a sturdier platform, but we connected ourselves to the global human rights movement, a worldwide freedom explosion that's taking place. No matter what these people are saying, there are grassroots movements who are claiming their right to human dignity and freedom, but also their right to freedom and food, their right to freedom of religion and freedom from religion, and all the human rights that we really are denied here in the United States, largely because we don't know that we're entitled to them. But there's the tactical connecting with others. There's also the analytical that you really tell a collective story, a community story of rights. Well, because we have to analyze who is reproductively privileged and why, and who is reproductively disadvantaged and why. And one of the things I like about reproductive justice is its universality because every human being has the same human rights. And as that applies to reproduction and fertility and motherhood? Well, at the same time, we are still dealing with the sterilization of vulnerable women, like women who are incarcerated, or women who are being coerced into not having children because they receive public assistance. White women who want to voluntarily sterilize themselves are facing all kinds of obstacles and barriers. And I am totally convinced that the restrictions on sex education, abortion, and birth control are about compelling white women to have more children. I am not convinced that they want more brown and black babies in America because they're too busy killing them. The other thing that you do is you turn the history on its head because when you put the people that you put at the center of your story, at the center of your story, you suddenly see that no women really had reproductive rights or justice or choice or any of it up until this moment. At least that's how I look at it. Well, the story of the United States starts with the genocide against the indigenous populations, Native American people. Uh, they were actually pushed into a situation where they were forced to reproductively disappear, you know, through passing out blankets, infected with smallpox, I mean, the Trail of Tears, all the horrors. And then you have the enslavement of Africans where the breeding of Africans actually created American wealth and still continues to create American wealth with the prison industrial complex. That brings it up to the contemporary time. There were people that say that the witches were midwives and reproductive Absolutely. rights workers in their time. Absolutely. Who were fighting the enclosure of, of their 
career, of their business, of their profession, of their skills and know-how. Well, to this day, white women who refuse to perform their manifest destiny, which is breed for the republic. Emphasis whether, on the man. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> whether it's through, you know, having a, a non-conforming gender identity or being, you know, just not interested in having children. You're seen as reproductive failures by the white supremacist ethos that governs this country. Whereas those of us who are people of color, when we choose to have children, we're reproductive dangers. Each of us perhaps could be thought of as having permission sometimes, as befits the ruling class, but not really rights as well. No, no. You have coercions. That's what we have. We have a system of interspersed and intermixed coercions that limit reproductive options for all people, but they do it in a very racially specific kind of way. And so when white women try to control their reproduction, they're told that they are not fulfilling their role as women. And I think that's really concerning because we've got this new, old, I guess old, new, belief that the best way to protect white feminist, white gender privilege is through supporting white supremacy. And we saw that with the election of Donald Trump, where 53% of white women supported him. That really should have alarmed a lot of people, where we've got, at the same time, a feminist self-determination ethos going on, and then the backlash to that is, to become anti-feminist and pro-white supremacy, and you think that's going to protect that thin layer of white privilege that doesn't even protect anything anymore? I mean, good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, um, it's a failed come project. Back, <laughs> come back to your story. Talk a little bit about who you consider your antecedents, if you will, in in this. Who you who you consider your your forebears in all of this? I have a lot of sheroes. I stand on a lot of shoulders of women, and I've always been aware of that because at the time I became a feminist, I did so in Washington, D.C., where there was this huge multi-generational black feminist movement, women who'd known Mary McLeod Bethune, and I you know, knew and worked with Dorothy Height and those women that I just admire. And they're the ones that kind of reined me in when I was in my mouthy 20s, <laughs> when I thought that everybody who was over 30 was an enemy. They bought me gently alone. They, but they didn't quite understand me because I had these budding dreadlocks at the time, and so I wasn't pressed and laid to the side like they were. And I think we're having that same kind of amusement as we look at the radical nature of the Black Lives Matter movement right now which interestingly did this wonderful policy document, mostly drafted by black women, that didn't mention reproductive justice. So the baked in patriarchy of the left is something that we're gonna still have to deal with because if you cannot understand how neoliberalism and capitalism depend on women's bodies, you're missing the boat. I'm guessing you talked to those women. Oh, we did. We had a meeting at Sister Song a few weeks ago. And what happened? Which was a great meeting because they were like stunned that they hadn't done it because these were mostly, as I said, black women. And then they was like, oh yeah, we're individual feminists, but we have not become political feminists yet, was one of the things that they said. And I think we're going to end the siloing of reproductive justice issues from racial justice issues with those kinds of strategic alliances that we're making. There's also a history piece that I would like to have you address, and that's the um, role of white birth control, so-called, um, activists in the early part of the 20th century. This has been a tough chapter of history for a lot of our movement around reproductive justice. Um, how do you, what's your, where do you come down on the legacy of Margaret Sanger and the founders of Planned Parenthood? Well, part of it is the ahistorical read that we have to history. We try to act like eugenics began with Francis Galton and, you know, in the late 1880s. 
I'm sorry, America was a eugenicist project. They, the word just had not been coined to describe the forced breeding of a enslaved Africans and the genocide of Native Americans. That's nothing but eugenics. Margaret Sanger is actually one of my sheroes because she, I like complicated people with loud contradictions because they actually produce loud impacts. And so she was of course absorbed with and enraptured with the eugenicists for a minute and then she disavowed them. Actually, Margaret Sanger was against abortion because it was so unsafe in her day. She was a public health nurse here in New York City who thought that birth control was the solution to all the unnecessary deaths that women were experiencing. And so I actually offer a critique of people who don't look at Margaret Sanger with a complex lens. They try to either vilify her or they try to enshrine her. And most of our great people are complicated people. And so I tend to want to you know, salute her at the same time I offer a critique of where she went wrong. So our people are complicated then and we're complicated now. And I appreciate that about those great people. Well, I appreciate that and more about you, Loretta. Thank you so very much for being with us oh, on the show. Thanks for having Always me on your show. Always great to have you. You can find out more and a link to Loretta and Ricky Solinger's book on reproductive justice at our website.